Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't want to flee from the presence of the Lord. I want to flee to the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled here, back up to verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and he went on board to go with them away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up it was a huge storm then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his god and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give us a thought and that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast their lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For catch this right here, for the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the 
Lord. Oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and for three nights. Uh-oh. That's not a place you want to be. When God calls you, my friend, you run into his presence. You don't run away. What we're experiencing here at the altar tonight is the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. This is what the Holy Spirit can do because he takes us like as we are. You know, we come in with our minds, we come in with our intellect, we come in sort of just like we are, human. And then the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God meets your flesh, you're going to react. And all of us react differently because why? We're all different. And God has wired us all different. And that's okay. But the word that I felt in my spirit tonight is that God is calling some of you to follow him even more closely than you ever have before. And some of you have been even wrestling with that call and wrestling with what that looks like in your life. And tonight the Lord says, I'm calling you. I'm calling you. When the Lord calls you, when he begins to speak to you, when he begins to nudge your heart, you're feeling him. When you feel that little nudge, when you feel that little thing inside, that's the Holy Spirit. And he's speaking. Did he speak to anybody tonight? Is he speaking to you right now? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And so tonight I want to share maybe for the next 15 or so minutes, because we took amazing time at the altar and that's the best. <laughs> altar time is the best. <laughs> but we need the word. You need the presence of God, and you need the Word of God. And together, that's a lethal combination <laughs> that will, like, open up your spirit. It's the Word. The Word, we feast on the Word, we get filled with the Spirit. Right? We feast on the Word of God, we get filled with the Spirit of God. So, my message tonight is the call of God. Jonah had seaweed hair living on a prayer. I don't know about you, but there's some days I have two kids under three. I feel like I'm living on a prayer. I'm one prayer away from a little breakdown. But the Holy Spirit. But thank God for his power. Thank God for his presence that keeps me, that seals my mouth when it needs to be sealed. That helps me to know how to parent, that helps me to know how to navigate this life. I happen to think that maybe Jonah was just living on a prayer with seaweed wrapped around his hair. The call of God will take you where the praise of man can't keep you. God doesn't call perfect people. He calls willing people. Simply anyone willing to be used by God will be. I 
remember when I was seven years old, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, but it was when I was 13 years old that I saw this guy preaching. He was like 17 or something. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just dropped this impression on my heart. He didn't like speak. It wasn't written out. given. To, it was just this impression on my heart. You could do that. That's it. And I went home, 13 years old. I was in eighth grade, going to ninth grade. And I told my dad, who was a, he was a pastor, I said, Dad, I feel like I need to write a sermon. <laughs> He's like, okay. And from that day forward, listen, the Holy Spirit will just call you in a moment. He'll give you an impression of something you can do. And then it's up to you to obey. It's up to you get to decide what you want to do with God's will. And one of the greatest gifts that he gave, Stephen, I'm so glad you're here. I love you, buddy. Um, I remember Stephen from youth camp. It's so good to see you. God has a great call in your life. But you know, you get those impressions from the Holy Spirit, like, maybe I should go talk to that person, or maybe I should, and the will of God, that's where it was. The will of God, it's like, you know, you can either obey it or not, but it's the greatest, one of the greatest gifts that God gave you is your free will. Because he wants you to choose relationship with him. He didn't make you a robot. But what is the will of God? What if you don't receive that impression like I felt that impression? Well, I have good news. Jesus told us what his will is. Are you ready? Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. If you have your word, highlight this in your word. Write this, write this verse down. What's God's will for my life? This is it, right here. Preach the kingdom of God. Cast out demons. Raise the dead and heal the sick. I'll say it one more time. Preach the kingdom of God. Cast out demons. Raise the dead and heal the sick. You know, Jesus told us that we could do it because he believes in us. He believes that we could actually do greater things than he did on this earth. Some days I wonder if I can just change another diaper. But he actually said that I could do this, that you could do this. That you could walk into a room and usher in the kingdom of God with your presence, with your words, with your kindness, with your love. Thank you, Jesus. So what can stop the call of God on your life is the question that I have for us tonight. What can stop the call of God on your life? Number one, not even your disobedience. Like I said, I'm a mom of two little ones, and I'm currently trying to teach my three-year-old how to obey, and this is no easy task. My heart for my son is that he would enjoy his life, that he would learn, that he would grow, that he would have fun. I'm trying to teach him things like safety and not running out into the busy street for his good and his protection. if God feels the same about us trying to teach us what is good for our freedom and for our protection you see the quicker my son obeys me the more peace and joy we'll have in our home the quicker you obey God the more peace and joy you will have in your life Sometimes when Elijah, my son, is in trouble, he'll run into his room and he'll close the door and he'll run into his closet as if I don't know where to find him. As
as if I'm stumped as to where he went. Don't think for a second that you can run out of God's sight. He's our father and he knows where you are. He knows where to find you. When you're hiding, when you're in the closet crying, when you're at church, when you're at work, when you're in your car about to say that thing, God knows where you are. The psalmist says in Psalm 139, there's no place I could go from his presence, right? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. There is no place you can go from God's presence. What can stop the call of God in your life? Not even your disobedience. You can run, but you can't hide, baby. When God calls you forth and puts an assignment on your life, he believes that you can do it. Don't run away. Run into God's arms of mercy. Repent. Repent. And you will be released to do God's will. And remember, that delayed obedience is disobedience. I don't want my son to obey me in an hour when I ask him, hey, you know, can you give that cup to your sister? Delayed obedience is disobedience. What else can stop the call of God number two? Not your detours, not your delays, or when you're headed the wrong direction. Jonah was headed the wrong direction. Stinking like a fish, stuck in the belly of a whale, pitch black, dark. Now, don't get me wrong. Delayed obedience, that is disobedience, when you choose your own way, when you want to do your own thing, when you just say, eh, I'm going to do it my way, right? AKA sin. All right. That will cost you somehow. It will cost you because sin has a consequence. It has a consequence in our lives. And it will cost you. But he'll always give you another chance. Always. Every single time. If you blow it, he says, you just come into my arms. Let me forgive you. Let me love you. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jonah 1.15, so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. Talk about a detour. I'm sure that Jonah never thought he was gonna be in that detour. Have you ever been detoured and Siri had to help you? Come on. I remember once I was on my way to, on, I was on my way to vacation with my husband and our friends. Did I share this story with you guys last time? Okay, good. And we were going to a tropical island. We were so excited. But the first problem was that I was flying Spirit Airlines. It is definitely not Holy Spirit Airlines. <laughs> Let me save you from future demonic strongholds <laughs> and don't fly Spirit Airlines. <laughs> so our flight was delayed and we got stuck in all places. We got stuck in Detroit, Michigan overnight. So our vacation was 
pushed back one whole day. But I knew this one thing. If I wanted to enjoy my vacation destination, I would have to work through my current frustration of delayed gratification. God can be glorified in your life when things don't go your way. Delayed gratification is the greatest opportunity for God glorification. Will you, will you bring God glory when things aren't going well? When everything hits the fan, will you praise God and say, you're good anyway. I love you even here. I'll praise you even in the middle of my best. I'll worship you right now, right here. God, you're worthy. You're worthy. Maybe that's that thing isn't gratified right now, but God, you can be glorified right now. And when you glorify God, you watch your spirit man shift. You watch it go from just feeling like, and eh, thinking about yourself, blah, 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 wah, 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 to God, I love you. And all of a sudden, you realize everything's going to be okay because I've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. I've got him. So, what did Jonah pray in the belly of the whale? Will you turn with me to Jonah chapter 2, verse 6? Let's actually start in verse 3. It says, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountain, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, oh Lord, my God. And I want you to notice something about this text because it says in verse one of chapter two, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. So this prayer was prayed before Jonah got spit out of the whale. Jonah was prophetically declaring in verse 6, Yet you brought my life from the pit. Oh Lord my God. The situation had not yet changed for Jonah. But he declared it. He stood on who he believed and knew God to be. Because one thing I forgot to share with you is that Jonah is a prophet. Jonah was a man of God. Jonah knew God's voice. When things don't look good for you, declare the word of God. Drench yourself in this word. Stop listening to the words of everybody else and declare the word of God. You need God's word. There's a time for your mama's word. There's a time for the pastor's word. But there is a time that you need only God's word. That is God's word that will set you free. And in that moment, in the belly of the whale, in the darkness, in his distress, in his disobedience, Jonah cried out to God. And he declared, yet God, you'll take my life up from the pit. Talk about faith. The way out was the way through for Jonah. He had to work through his feelings. I feel the anointing. He had to wrestle with the weight of his choices and the consequences. He had to cry out to God. Maybe God hasn't changed your circumstances yet because he's trying to change you first. God was going to get to Jonah one way or another. 
whether through his obedience, which would have made it a lot easier, or his disobedience. But God had to change Jonah first. He had to do a work in Jonah. And in that, the belly of the whale, Jonah had some time to talk to God. God will do whatever he can to get you alone with him so you have to talk to him. And he wants to talk to you. He wants to speak to you. You may feel stuck on the long road, but you need to hear tonight that the way out is the way through. Through that hardship, through that pain, through that relationship, through that calling, keep walking with Jesus. Don't stop, don't stop here. Someone say, don't stop here. Don't stop here. Jonah was stuck in the belly of the whale for how many days? Three days and three nights. There's another guy that was stuck in the belly of the earth for three days and for three nights. And he even had to descend, it says, to hell to get the keys of hell from Satan himself. I'm guessing it looked pretty dark for Jesus too. But because he was God, he conquered death. He went to the darkest place for you and me. He went into the belly of the earth. He went to that place. Resurrection was on the other side. Resurrection was on the other side. God still had a plan. God still had a purpose. God still had a breakthrough. When it seems dark, when you don't know up from down, God still has a breakthrough for you. God still has an anointing for you. God still has a plan for you, my friend. Don't stop here. Jonah, he probably felt like, is this it? I'm sure he wrestled with those thoughts, but in the midst of wrestling with those thoughts, he declared the word. In the midst of feeling confused, in the midst of feeling darkness, he declared the word. And what does it say? It says that God appointed the whale for Jonah. Don't be so disappointed about the situations in your life that God has appointed. Maybe God has appointed a situation because you're running all these other ways and he's saying, this is where I can get your attention. The story of Jonah is an outrageous story about the mercy of God. What can stop the call of God on your life? Not your distress, not your doubt, and not your disappointments. Jonah 1, 17, and the Lord appointed a great fish. Your stress can't stop the will of God. I imagine Jonah was feeling a little bit of stress when the storm was raging and they were about to throw him into the ocean. Cue Titanic scene. But even at Jonah's worst moments, God had a plan. And maybe you have found yourself in an unexpected place like Jonah in a place you never in a million years thought you would be. But that is the place that God will speak to you and anoint you. What has God appointed in your life? The last point I want to make comes from Jonah 
and three, one through 10. You've been delivered to deliver. Let's read that in Jonah 2.10 and see what happens. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Someone say, praise God. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. God says, let's see if he'll do it this time. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Someone say great city. Great city. Three days journey in breadth. There's that three again. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out. Are you ready for the big word that Jonah was to give to the people of Nineveh? This is what he said. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a what? A fast. Pastor Lindsay's talking about you guys are going to have a fast. There's power in your prayers. They called for a fast. They put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them to the least of them. And the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed on drink or water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, let them call out, someone say call out, call out. mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, are you ready? When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did what? He did what? He did not do it. God delivered Jonah. To de for Jonah to deliver an eight-word sermon to the people of Nineveh. And that word, count it, it's eight words, that saved that entire city. They turned their hearts to God. They repented, and God saved a city. When God calls you to do something, he usually starts with something kind of small. Eight words. What if God gave you eight words for your life to give to a friend, to encourage someone? Will you be obedient and give it? Come on. I got one right here. Eight words was all it took. God saved an entire city. He's delivered you, Colossians says, from the dominion of darkness and called you into what? His glorious light. You've been delivered from the darkness. Do I have anybody in here who can say, I've been delivered from some darkness? Come on, I've been delivered. I've been delivered from a dark place. Receive 
been delivered to deliver. Someone say, I'm a deliverer. You don't know who is on the verge of life and death. You might see them at the gas station and they just look down. Gives you one prophetic word, encouraging word. Hey man, I just want you to know, I felt in my heart just to tell you God has a plan for your life. That word could change someone's entire life. Will you give the word that God has put in your spirit? What if we all got lit up on fire to go out into the world and begin to make more friends for Jesus? What word would you want to hear if you were in that situation? Be bold. Because people need the power and the presence of God. And I'll wrap up with this last thought. Someone say, bring it on home. Did you guys receive tonight? Thank you, Lord. It said in Jonah 3, 2, the Lord said, arise, go to Nineveh in that great city. The Bible is full of God telling people to speak out. In Acts 18, one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No one is going to t attack you or harm you, because I have many people in this city. That's when Paul was in prison or on house arrest, one of those. He's in a dark place. God will give you the words, but most importantly, he will give you his spirit. For this reason, 2 Timothy 1, 6, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. You know why we lay hands on each other? Because we believe that th there is anointing power. It's not our power, it's God's. And we're just conduits. We're conduits. Just be a conduit of his power. Be a conduit of his presence. Your tongue is powerful and God will anoint it. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. The story of Jonah is an incredible and outrageous story of the mercy and compassion of God to save a city and to save a man stuck in the belly of a whale. Yes, it was about God's judgment, but even more than that, it was about his mercy, because his mercy triumphed his judgment. Will you pray with me? Maybe tonight there's an area of your life that you need to repent, and you need to ask God's mercy to come and triumph. Anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anybody. If you're two or 92. Thank you, Jesus. And I just wouldn't want to wrap up this time together without asking one question. Does anybody in here want to give their life to Jesus. Tonight is your night. He's in the house. And he's good. And he'll forgive all your sins. He'll wash you clean. I just want to ask if there's anybody who would say, Jesus, give my life to you tonight. I don't exactly know what that looks like, but I want to start this journey with you right here. Will you lift your hand if that's you? Do you want to give your heart to the Lord? 
Thank you. 